Researchers in the field of psychology and neuroscience believe that intelligence can't be observed directly. This is a contradictory stance to take, as we often know an intelligent person when we meet them. Thus, there has to be some observable characteristics we see that allows us to identify an intelligent person. So, how do we know that intelligence actually exists? If it does exist, do people with certain demographic characteristics, such as being wealthy or poor, or with certain racial identities, have different levels of intelligence? Can intelligence change over time, or is it immutable? Does brain size matter when it comes to intelligence, or is this today's version of phrenology? Y'all, I have so many questions. So today, I'm focusing on the answers from science about all of this and more. However, before I do, make sure to subscribe to this channel if you want to learn more about that thing in your head. No, not those thoughts about how humans may never reach the point in which they can overcome their flaws, thus preventing an apocalyptic event that would obliterate everyone and everything in their wake. Yeah, I talk about this for fun. But the brain. Before we get started, I want it to be made very clear. Intelligence and IQ testing is a controversial topic both inside and outside of the scientific community. Content creators, understandably, shy away from topics like this, and for good reason. You see, YouTube traditionally demonetizes videos such as this due to the controversy this topic often provokes. However, doing so often stifles the conversation, and more importantly, the scientific evidence that either supports a genetic basis for intelligence or disproves a genetic basis for intelligence. So let's stick to what science actually understands about intelligence, genetics, and the brain. Psychologists have traditionally used intelligence tests to measure, well, intelligence. But there's a problem that many recognize. How does one operationally define an arguably subjective concept? Psychologists have decided that intelligence means the capacity for rational thought, purposeful action, and one's ability to successfully navigate one's environment. In this definition, there's a level of flexibility built in to accommodate the vastly different environments in which we may encounter. While there's flexibility within the definition itself, that's about all you're going to get, because when it comes to what is often tested, this g-factor, there's very little wiggle room. G-factor is a compilation of factors that is supposed to indicate general mental ability. And these factors include reasoning, problem solving, memory, knowledge, and successful adaptations to one's surroundings. That usually being the testing environment in which the IQ is often measured. These complications in really defining general intelligence has led many researchers to simply define intelligence by deferring to the tests they use to measure it. For example, Researchers may state the following. There was a positive correlation between prefrontal cortical activity and matrix reasoning as measured by the ways 4. For now, this may be the best way for researchers to define what it is that they're actually measuring, because there are a variety of ways to view intelligence. Defining intelligence as a g-factor does not address that there may be multiple ways of being smart, and that this may vary across place and time. A great example of this is when the Capelli people in Liberia were given a set of items to group. Instead of grouping objects based on items, such as food items belonging to the food group, clothing items belonging to the clothes group, and utensil items belonging to, well, you guessed it, the utensil group, they grouped items based on function. As an example, they would place an orange, a food, with a knife, a utensil. Then, when asked how would a fool categorize these objects, they then placed the items in categories to which we would most likely be accustomed to. The orange with the foods, and the knife with the utensil. That's really cool, by the way. This and many other examples have led some researchers to adopt the idea of multiple intelligences. One prominent theory, Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, identifies eight different aspects of intelligence, as opposed to the g-factor's one dimension of intelligence. All of this has not prevented researchers, school administrators, and universities from administering intelligence tests or utilizing tests based Based off of them, such as the SIT, to research intelligence and to place people into or exclude people from certain programs and schools. That being the case, what are IQ tests? 
tests. Generally, these tests comprise of different components designed to measure someone's g-factor, or general intellectual ability. There are a variety of tests which claim to measure the same thing. Some tests, such as those designed for college admissions, even claim to predict one's educational success. For instance, the first IQ test designed for use in the United States was the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, which was originally developed in 1916. It utilizes five cognitive factors in order to generate a single score. The average range of scores is between 90 and 109. According to researchers, with the rise of the desire for efficient use of educational resources and the idea of an absolute heritability of ability, schools easily took to using IQ tests as a means to stratify students, often along racial and social lines. During desegregation of school systems, IQ tests were used to place racial minorities into remedial classes away from the white majority, where they were designated as unteachable. Further, IQ tests were infused into the educational system, and many lessons and teaching methodologies were based on obtaining knowledge tested on these tests. Knowledge that was not provided to racial minorities who were removed from standard classes. While IQ tests are not applied in the same manner today, you will still see a byproduct of this practice in today's learning environment. That being teaching methodologies centered around passage of a test as opposed to teaching methods designed to stimulate curiosity, critical thinking, and personal growth. Here you may note a potential problem with IQ tests that led many to question their efficiency and use. That being, in the United States, IQ tests were designed to stratify people based on economic and racial lines, a design that was intertwined into the school systems that can still be seen today. Some researchers argue that intelligence tests are a means of reinforcing dominant values and justifying inequalities under the guise of objectivity. In order to justify their use and applicability, a minority of proponents point towards the revisions these tests have undergone and argue that they can be applied as a cultural-free determination of unchangeable biological intelligence. However, the vast majority of testing proponents admit that the scores generated from these tests most likely represent both biological and societal factors. One way in which researchers try to identify a biological basis for intelligence is by examining the brain. Regarding potential brain areas associated with intelligence, as measured by these IQ tests, high IQs were associated with increased activation of the prefrontal cortex, superior parietal cortex, temporal cortex, and occipital lobes. Particularly, the lateral prefrontal cortex may be heavily involved in problem solving and reasoning as a measure of intelligence. In relation to brain size and function, there are minor correlations associated with size and intelligence, but these findings are inconsistent. Importantly, researchers note that size may not be as important as efficiency of neurons. An interesting finding is that neuronal functioning and speed may be heavily implicated in intelligence as measured by standard IQ tests. For instance, scientists have discovered that higher intelligence is correlated with more efficient metabolism of glucose. Researchers have also seen greater neural efficiency in brain areas of participants where they completed a task in which they excelled. We can also look to animal models to determine the importance of neuronal density over brain size regarding intellectual abilities. The human brain is not the largest brain, even when controlling for body size within the animal kingdom. However, humans do have the highest density of neurons within the brain throughout the animal kingdom. Of course, this is also assuming humans to be the most intelligent known animal on Earth. And to be perfectly honest, that is debatable. Regarding brain function and morphology, as evidence for a biological basis for intelligence, there appears to be some convincing evidence that demonstrates that function and efficiency of neurons may be related to intelligence. And this evidence appears to be more consistently replicated than studies involving brain size. In fact, human brain size has been decreasing, potentially as a function of conveniences offered from modern society. Yet, IQ scores continue to rise globally. Now, before you get excited about a potential biological basis for intelligence, as indicated by findings in neuroscience, it is important that you understand a few key things. First, all studies I mentioned were correlational studies, thus we cannot determine cause and effect. Lastly, many environmental factors affect the brain. For instance, learning the art of juggling results in denser cortical mass within the motor cortex that was not present prior to learning this new skill. Thus, keep in mind that the brain, 
even the brain of adults, is plastic and susceptible to change. And this change may be reflected in IQ scores either positively or negatively. Potentially more compelling evidence of a biological basis of intelligence may be seen by looking at genetics and heritability. Regarding genetics, no one gene has been identified, but researchers believe that intelligence may be represented across multiple genes. As such, they estimated that about 51% of the variation in fluid intelligence can be accounted for by multiple genes, while 40% of the variation in crystallized intelligence may be accounted for by multiple genes. But little is known about these genes and how they interact with each other in order to account for the observed variation. Thus, researchers often rely on heritability estimates in order to determine the level of genetic influence on intelligence. Now before I go into what researchers have discovered, I'm going to break down what heritability actually means. Heritability is a ratio measuring genetic variation, genotypic variation, to total observed variation, phenotypic variation, within any given population. Therefore, any findings discovered for a given population is not designed to be expanded to other populations. This also means that it is not a direct measure of genes. Another applicable measure for within population is environmentality. This is the ratio of environmental variation to phenotypic variation. Environmentality is inversely related to heritability, so that if heritability is 60%, then environmentality is 40%. In order to exemplify the problem with equating genetics to heritability, consider this. If all humans are always born with one heart, and there are never any deviations from this biological property, then the genotypic variation is 100. So in order to get our heritability estimate, we add 100 or 1 to the numerator. Now, attending to our observable variation, phenotypic variation, we note that since genotypic variation is always 100, there is no observable variation. So we add zero to the denominator. Recalling a bit of grade school math, you may immediately recognize the problem. Any number divisible by zero results in an error. It's impossible. Who knew you were going to get a math lesson? While being born with a heart is 100% genetic, there's no heritability. Thus, differences that variability are required for the calculation of heritability estimates. Another thing to keep in mind is that just because something may be highly heritable, like have a heritability estimate of, say, 90%, as is the case with height, that says nothing about if that is modifiable. And height has been shown to be highly modifiable based on environmental situations. So just because it may be biologically based, we may or may not be able to change the expression of a certain trait with the help of environmental factors. Now with all of this information, where are we in our understanding of heritability and intelligence? Based on identical twin studies, intelligence may be highly heritable at 80% or moderately heritable at 40%. Researchers also note that environmental factors, such as socioeconomic status, or SES, appear to determine if the variation in intelligence can be explained by heritability or environment. For instance, in low SES families, shared environment accounted for the majority of the variation in IQs, while in high SES families, heritability accounted for the majority of the variation in IQs. In fact, according to researchers, heritability varies substantially based on socioeconomic status. Thus, based on the available scientific research, there appears to be an interplay between environment and heritability when it comes to intelligence. Certain environments may be able to modify either positively or negatively human intelligence as measured by these IQ tests. As mentioned, one such modifier appears to be SES, with a particular negative influence seen on those within the low SES strata. However, due to the fact that researchers have seen a global rise in IQ scores, there appears to be a positive modifier that can impact these scores. A recent meta-analysis inspecting 600,000 participants discovered a positive influence of education on IQ scores. The results indicate that for every year of education, there was a 1 to 5 point increase in IQ scores. Researchers have also discovered an association between literacy and IQ scores. As such, another environmental IQ modifier may be literacy, as when literacy increases within a population, so too do IQ scores. Conversely, when literacy rates decrease within a population, IQ scores also decrease. The effect of both education and SES indicate that 
for better or for worse, IQ scores are modifiable based on certain environmental factors. Thus, intelligence, as measured by IQ tests, can be viewed as such. There may be a real biological and genetic basis for intelligence, and this may be in the form of an intelligence ability range. The environment, when nurturing via good education, may result in the manifestation of intellectual abilities at the higher end of that biologically based intelligence range. Alternatively, the environment, when deprived of resources, as is the case in low SES conditions, or lack of quality education resulting in low literacy rates, may result in the manifestation of intellectual abilities at the lower end of that biologically based intelligence range. Now that you have a better understanding of the historical use of intelligence tests, the potential biological basis of intelligence, and environmental factors known to modify intellectual abilities, as measured by intelligence tests, I feel compelled to address the elephant in the room. The relationship between race and IQ scores. According to researchers, race is a socially derived concept that lacks scientific support. Currently, the scientific consensus is that there is no genetic backing to support the grouping of people by the racial categories we know – black, white, Asian, etc. In fact, there is more genetic variation within socially identified races than between socially constructed races. Nevertheless, a real difference does appear to exist between IQ scores of blacks and whites in the United States, with black Americans underperforming when compared to white Americans. In the 20th century, black Americans were 15 points, or one standard deviation, below the IQ scores of white Americans. A more recent analysis conducted early in the 21st century found that the differences between IQ scores obtained by white Americans and IQ scores obtained by black Americans have narrowed by 5 to 6 points. The differences seen in IQ scores of black Americans and white Americans have led some to conclude the existence of clear genetically based differences, which manifest in both physical appearance and intellectual ability. For people who subscribe to this idea, intellectual ability is an immutable trait that is 100% heritable, meaning the environment excluding illnesses and injury has no impact on intellectual ability. However, in the 1970s it was discovered that SES largely accounted for the differences seen in IQ scores and academic achievement among white and black Americans. This finding has held consistent over time. More recently, researchers have discovered biases infused in many of these tests designed to measure general intellectual ability. This bias tended to favor white and Asian Americans. Importantly, the differences between IQ scores of white and black Americans are based on correlational studies only. This means that there may be a variety of unknown environmental factors accounting for these differences. Further, as there exists no genetic basis for determining well-known racial categories often used to classify people, researchers have been unable to associate genes contributing to racial composition as the cause of differences in intellectual ability. Some may take an anti-scientific leap and conclude, based on the existence of IQ score differences and nothing more, that genes contribute to racial composition, and that contribution results in a variety of innate differences, including differences in intellectual ability. To make this conclusion, one would have to assume a variety of points not supported by science, and they include genes resulting in the races as they are currently constructed, immutable intelligence that cannot be impacted by environmental factors, no biases favoring white and Asian Americans infused in general ability tests. No existence in the narrowing of the white-black gap in IQ scores, and a brain that lacks neuroplasticity and the capacity for change, among various other non-scientific points. Intellectual ability is manifestation based on genetic and environmental factors, and the more controversial subject regarding race and IQ is a complex topic, with a lot of misinformation circulating and even masquerading as scientifically supported. As complex and as controversial as it may be, let's review what is currently understood by other scientists. In the United States, during the 19th and mid-20th century, intelligence tests were utilized to support social stratification along racial and fiscal lines. Intelligence tests are designed to measure specific aspects of mental ability and may not be measuring all facets of intelligence. 
Nevertheless, these tests continue to be used today, and in many cases are used to determine university and program placement, as is the case with tests like the SAT. Intellectual ability tests may be associated with academic achievement, but these findings are correlational, not causational, and may be the result of selection bias. Further, the G factor, argued by some as a neutral estimate of intellectual ability, especially one's ability to adapt, has been used to determine areas of the brain associated with intellectual ability. And there is some support that brain size is correlated with intelligence. But the data is inconsistent. More consistent data supports a positive association between efficiency and functionality of neurons in relation to IQ scores. As an additional point on the biological basis for intellectual ability, an approximately 50% heritability estimate appears to be a consistent finding. Further, neuroscientists, biologists, geneticists, etc. recognize that, in general, the manifestation of intellectual ability is brought about due to the interplay between genetics and the environment. This has been particularly clear when SES is introduced into these heritability estimates. Another environmental modifier on intellectual ability appears to be education. The impact of well-resourced education on intellectual ability is consistent and robust. That means it's really powerful. Regarding racial discrepancies in IQ scores, there is currently no genetic explanation for these differences. The best and consistent explanation is an environmental one in which low SES appears to heavily modify intellectual outcomes. Thus, addressing SES differences and providing educational resources may help further narrow the differences in Black American and White American IQ scores. Importantly, whether intelligence tests measure actual intelligence, or even if intelligence can change with one's environment, the scientific community has much to learn about the nature of intelligence and how it can be objectively measured. All of my research for this video relied on peer-reviewed sources. If you're interested in learning more, you can find the articles I utilize in this episode in the description box below. I really hope that you found this video informative, and if you liked what you watched, please consider subscribing to my channel and sharing with family and friends. Also, make sure to hit that like button. Also, also, if you want to support my channel with big Brainiac energy, head on over to my Patreon page to become a contributing member. As always, thank you for watching.